Okay, thank you to the organizers and uh, to Annette and Mike for the introduction. And so I'll talk to you um, about some of our work uh, looking not uh, solely at the immune system, but at colonization factors. And I think that many of the introductory slides that I normally use um, I've taken out of this uh, presentation because they've already been given, but I want to remind you of the data that we've already seen mostly yesterday and then, and then Maria's work as well. Thinking about the succession of organisms that colonize um, the infant and how we assemble our microbiomes and, and what are the um, molecular mechanisms by which we assemble our microbiomes. And that's really what our lab is interested in is trying to understand um, on, an, on an experimental level, on a molecular level, how uh, microbes colonize us and uh, subsequently how they confer benefits in terms of immunologic and neurologic health. And so uh, one introductory slide only just to remind you about this notion of uh, dysbiosis or alterations. And so this is just another way of looking at the data that we've already seen. This is um, a healthy gut in, um, in people looking uh, across uh, many regions of the gut and um, uh, highlighting the importance or the prominence of uh, Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes in uh, a healthy individual, but then we see that the landscape is quite different in uh, patients with IBD, uh, lowering of the Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes, and an increase in the, um, uh, mainly the proteobacteria, which are minor species in humans. And um, just by way of setting the context for the types of experiments that we do, um, I think that this implies, there's no cause or effect relationships here, but that this implies that there are bad players and good players, and perhaps health and disease is uh, in the balance of the proportions of these organisms. And so once again, we don't really do uh, a lot of metagenomics, and so we don't uh, look at community profiles. But the approach that we've taken is to use model organisms, to use organisms that we can genetically manipulate, associate into mice, and then look at outcomes, and then really, once again, get this molecular relationship between the bug and the host uh, to try, try and understand um, how the microbiome impacts us. And so um, the organism, uh, one of the organisms that we work with is Bacteria fragilis. And so this is an organism that's been studied for many, many years, initially by people like Sidney Feingold, who studied many of these anaerobes, many of the Bacteroidae species. And Bacteroidae, uh, as you know, is, is uh, the most common uh, genus in most humans in the, in the um, gastrointestinal tract. It's a very unique organism in many ways. And so people like uh, Dennis Casper and Lori Comstock have shown that um, Bacteroides um, expresses multiple capsular polysaccharides within each uh, genome. And so this is, once again, very rare for organisms because most bacteria will express one capsular polysaccharide per genome. There are obviously different serotypes. But here we have multiple capsular polysaccharides, two of which have a very unique structure in, in that they're positively charged and negatively charged within each subunit. So this one subunit of these very large molecules. And um, the, or, uh, the molecule that we focused on is polysaccharide A, PSA, because it was previously shown by Dennis and others that uh, PSA induces CD4 positive T cell proliferation. And so we became interested in how that impacts the host during colonization and symbiosis. And so uh, many years ago, we sort of took a leap of faith at the time and uh, wondered whether or not this organism and this particular molecule would be protective in models of inflammatory bowel disease. And we chose IBD because of its proximity to the microbiota. This is the TMBS model of colitis. We've tested several other models as well, where you see an acute weight loss in, um, in mice after induction of disease. But if the animals were fed or, uh, PSA orally, you can see that they're ameliorated from the weight loss. This is the colitis that ensues in TMBS um, treatment, but oral feeding of these animals with PSA. Um, it shows uh, pretty much an unremarkable um, intestine. And we can do the, the um, uh, uh, treatment both prophylactically and therapeutically and get essentially the same results. And the idea is that, that someday PSA hopefully will be a therapeutic for inflammatory bowel disease. And so that's the, the disease. And so we've looked at the immune response. And here, once again, you can see that there is an increase in TH17 cells, these IL-17 uh, producing CD4 positive T cells that we've already heard about in the TMBS, um, in the colitic animals, but then highly reduced in um, animals that were treated with the polysaccharide. And so uh, we wondered what the mechanism was, and um, there are multiple ways that one can imagine TH17 cells, which are pro-inflammatory, could be, could be um, reduced in number or inactivated. But uh, it appears that PSA doesn't um, uh, cripple parts of the immune system or the pro-inflammatory immune system. It actually activates other arms of the immune system, um, uh, specifically regulatory T cells. And we've already, once again, heard a little bit about these as well. So regulatory T cells are marked by transcription factor, FOXP3. 
And uh, here we use CD25 as another marker. And as you can see, uh, both healthy animals and animals with colitis have the same uh, relative proportions in the intestine of these regulatory T cells. But if we treat animals, even though they were treated with, um, with the colitic agent, and if we administer uh, PSA orally, you can see the proportional increase in these FOXP3 positive cells. There's also a numerical increase, and PSA also increases the transcription of FOXP3. And so what this implies is that on a cell intrinsic basis, there's an increased regulatory activity. In fact, we measured this in vitro. I won't show the data for the sake of time, but each regulatory T cell is more suppressive if it came from an animal with PSA. And so um, following our work, several other groups have shown uh, very similar results, in fact, extended some of the results um, in other systems. And these include uh, single organisms like Fecalobacterium presnitzi. This is a wonderful story that this organism, and I think many of you already know this, um, was isolated from um, patients uh, or was depleted in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, signifying that the absence of the organism may be a risk factor for disease and then subsequently shown to have anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, something very similar recently from, um, from uh, Hiroshi Takeda's lab showed um, that uh, a, an organism called Bifidobacterium brevet induces interleukin-10, an anti-inflammatory cytokine, whereas another probiotic doesn't, and then this was uh, recently published uh, just last year. And then, once again, the very famous story from, uh, from Kenya Honda, both in mice and in humans, that a consortium of Clostridia induce regulatory T cells in the colon and, and, and expand their proportions and also protect against inflammatory bowel disease. And um, another story from uh, Andrew McPherson showing that uh, altered shadeless flora can induce uh, uh, ITREGs or inducible TREGs here marked by uh, um, Helios expression. So many examples, once again, both individual organisms as well as consortia that induce regulatory T cells and later today, we'll hear about a wonderful story from Wendy Garrett um, looking at the molecular mechanisms by which some of these organisms may be inducing regulatory T cells. So this notion of regulatory T cell induction um, appears to be quite broad in, in several organisms. So uh, going back to PSA, so then we uh, characterized what the um, uh, signaling pathways were, and I'm just going to show you just um, a preliminary or just some data from that. And so we've worked out the entire signal transduction cascade, but here uh, TLR2 is clearly um, very important because this is the data I showed you. So this is uh, colitis scores in wild type mice untreated and then treated with PSA. If we do the same thing in TLR2 knockout animals, we see no protection. Um, in wild type animals, PSA induces interleukin-10, this anti-inflammatory cytokine that I told you about, suppresses IL-17. We see no such um, uh, phenotype in TLR2 knockout animals. And uh, when we look at regulatory T cell proportions, those are not increased in uh, TLR2 knockouts. So TLR2 is clearly important in uh, PSA signaling and in work I'm not going to talk about. We know that TLR2, both on the dendritic cell and the T cell, is important for these anti-inflammatory effects. And so to summarize um, the potential of PSA as um, uh, a therapeutic for inflammatory bowel disease, uh, I think the way that this mechanism wor is working is that PSA is secreted by uh, outer membrane vesicles from uh, bacteria spagyl. So we've shown that PSA is packaged into these vesicles, taken up by dendritic cells, and in a very unique process presented by MHC class two to naive T cells, induces the differentiation of these regulatory T cells and, and their expansion, regulatory T cells uh, then produce a, a cytokine called interleukin-10, which then ameliorates uh, intestinal inflammation. And um, Lloyd Casper has also shown that the same process, oral feeding of PSA, is protective in models of MS and, and, so, and, can, and ameliorate um, uh, inflammation in the central nervous system. So perhaps there are effects beyond just colitis as well. And so then we got really interested in how this organism colonizes, or in fact, how the bacteroides colonize. And once again, many of the talks uh, have alluded to this notion of who's there and uh, what happens during perturbation. And so we approach this from, a, once again, a very different angle of using model organisms to understand what um, people like Dav David Relman and many, many others have shown, is that there's a unique pattern in mammals for the speciation of organisms. And so even those in the back row can see that these, this pattern among humans and other animals is quite similar. So there's some specificity, so some factors that are mediating that, that colonization event and selecting for particular organisms which can inhabit the gut, whereas all the other organisms in the ecosystem and terrestrial and um, aquatic environments are not permanent residents of our intestines. There's clearly specificity in what uh, organisms colonize us, 
and their stability. And once again, we've heard about this concept as well. And here also is uh, data from David showing in either alphyla, but more particularly in Bacteroides, is uh, these are three subjects, uh, and these are the, the different organisms in those subjects. And you can see that before um, antibiotic treatment, there's a particular pattern. These blue bars um, um, designate a, a time frame where they are uh, treated with Cipro, and you can see that there's a decrease in uh, most organisms, but very quickly after um, the cessation of, of the antibiotic, those organisms come back. So uh, clearly these organisms are stable on a global level, and, and once again, multiple other studies have shown this, and we became really interested in what are um, the mechanisms that mediate this. And so a very talented student in the laboratory, Melanie Lee, took on this very ambitious project of trying to assemble a microbiome from scratch. And the way she started doing this is you know, working with, with um, organisms that we can culture and genetically manipulate and adding them sequentially to, to uh, mice and looking at colonization. And so initially, if we take a mouse and say this is a germ-free animal and we give it an inoculum of bacteria's fragilis, we see a very nice colonization of this organism um, because uh, germ-free animals are, are uh, amenable to colonization by almost anything, but if then we, uh, a few days later, come back with Bacteroides vulgatus, a very highly related species, different from Bacteroides uh, fragilis, you see that there's really no competition between these two organisms. We can do this with uh, Bacteroides fragilis and Bacteroides data out of Omicron. Once again, see no difference, and this makes sense because many of us are colonized by multiple Bacteroides species. We can reverse the orders of colonization. There are really no effects there. But uh, the surprise came when we took an animal and mono-associated with Bacteroides fragilis and then challenged that um, same animal with the isogenic strain, the same exact strain of Bacteroides fragilis, just marked by an antibiotic resistance gene. And now in a germ-free or at least in a mono-associated mouse, we can colonize or challenge with Bacteroides fragilis, and this organism does not colonize. And uh, this was, you know, once again, very surprising to us. And initially, we thought it was the antibiotic resistant gene, so we swapped those around. We've done this by other methods as well. Every single time, Bacteroides fragilis, when challenged to a Bacteroides fragilis monocolonized animal, does not colonize. The same thing with Bacteroides vulgatus, and now we've shown this with four different Bacteroides species, that there's competition between, uh, within an organism, but not between organisms. We don't see the same effect with E. coli. We don't see this with Enterococcus faecalis. So there's something specific about the Bacteroides that mediate this phenotype. And once again, in data I'm not going to show you, if we were to take uh, the animal that's mono-associated with either of these Bacteroides, and then give an antibiotic at the time of uh, challenge, to which um, the initial strain is sensitive, but um, the challenge strain is resistant, we can actually displace uh, the initial strain and get the challenge strain to colonize. And I think what this suggested to us is that there's some limiting nutrients or some limiting space that the initial organism occupies and then excludes or resists the colonization by, um, by the challenge strain. And so what we did, um, instead of taking a, a larger metagenomic approach, is we took an experimentomics approach, and I think Fred stole a little bit of my thunder yesterday by introducing this concept. And so this is what we do in the laboratory, is when we have a problem, we design experiments to, to um, tackle this. And the way Melanie uh, devised this, this uh, very ingenious uh, screen is that she took genome fragments from Bacteroides fragilis and transfected them into Bacteroides vulgatus. Remember, these two organisms do not compete with each other. And so imagine if there was a, a locus or, or, or a piece of, um, of DNA that conferred Bacteroides fragilis specific colonization phenotype, and perhaps here um, expressed in red, that we'd have some clones that, uh, that contain this element, whereas most of the clones of Bacteroides vulgatus do not contain this element, so they act like Bacteroides vulgatus. And then we took germ-free animals uh, and uh, mono-associated them with Bacteroides vulgatus, and then challenged them with pools of these clones that contain fragments of Bacteroides fragilis. And so imagine most of these uh, in green are Bacteroides vulgatus, and as I showed you before, they will get cleared over time because they cannot compete with the indigenous strains. But if there was one uh, isolate uh, shown in red that uh, contained a Bacteroides fragilis um, colonizing factor, then it should be able to uh, dual associate this animal, and then after time we can isolate that organism and sequence the genes and see what we find. So she did this for 2,100 clones, all in mice, and what we discovered were two clones um, out of that entire pool. The rest were all cleared. 
both of those clones contain the same um, uh, genetic region, and, and that's shown here. And then when we sequence this, uh, to our surprise, maybe not to our surprise, is that the genes um, contain polysaccharide utilization loci. And so they have these characteristic SUS-C, SUS-D homologs, and I'll talk a little bit about those as well. They have regulatory elements up front, so the sigma factor and anti-sigma factor, and we've shown that they control expression of these genes, and uh, we started to characterize this. And so once again, we work with organisms that we can genetically manipulate so we can make mutants in these organisms and then test colonization factors. And so here what you're looking at is um, day 30 of the exact same graph I showed you earlier. So the challenge strain, or so the initial strain with the challenge strain, once again by day 30, everything is cleared. So you can see very clear phenotypes. But if we take animals and monosociate them with, um, with um, the SUS-C homolog, which we call CCFC, or the SUS-D homolog, CCFD, that we lose this phenotype. So if the initial strain does not have this factor, then now the challenge strain can colonize. The CCFE does not have uh, a phenotype, and I think we know uh, why that is, because there's redundancy in that gene. And if we knock out the entire operon, we see that there's a loss of function and classical microbiology, we can take uh, the mutant and then uh, complement the mutant on a plasmid with the entire operon and once again restore um, this colonization resistance phenotype. So we can do this with Bacteroides fragilis. We did the exact same thing with Bacteroides vulgatus and, and, and saw a similar phenotype where uh, Bacteroides vulgatus will uh, compete against itself, but if you make a mutant of Bacteroides vulgatus, it can no longer exclude uh, challenge by the wild type strain. And so, as I mentioned, these polysaccharide utilization loci have been studied for many years. Uh, one of the pioneers of this is Abigail Salyers, who uh, really figured out much of the biochemistry of this. And the way these systems work uh, in, in a generalized fashion is that SUS-C is a pore, SUS-D is an outer membrane lip lipoprotein, and they take uh, complex sugars, channel them through, break them down, channel them through SUS-C, and then the organism uses it for, for nutrients. And so these uh, operons are widely dispersed in the bacteria. So uh, theta out of Omicron has 88 of them. Uh, Fragilis has 36 of these. And what we've shown is that the CCF homologs, those genes that we isolated, are very, very unique on many characteristic levels. And they're only found once in each of these genomes, if you look at their, their homology. And so once again, as I mentioned, these genes have been studied before, but they've been studied in um, the context of foraging. And so this is a very nice work by Eric Martens and Jeff Gordon, where um, they knocked out a sigma factor that controls expression of five of these polysaccharide utilization loci. And if they colonize mice in a, on a rich diet, they see um, no competition. But if they switch to a restricted diet, they can see that the wild type can colonize, but now the mutant cannot. And so uh, that's where this concept of foraging comes from, is if the diet is restricted, that the bacteria then use host mucus, uh, um, likely host mucus, as an energy source because they can't use the, the more abundant uh, dietary fibers. And so once again, you get this colonization phenotype, once again, only upon switching to, um, to this restricted diet. And then there's a defect in vertical transmission. I know this is hard to see, but this is this 2008 cell host and micro paper, if you want to look at this, a uh, defect in vertical transmission. Um, in fact, we don't see a defect in vertical transmission. I'll get to, I'll get to that in a second. But our, uh, the operon that we're studying is clearly different from this phenotype. And um, Justin Sonnenberg also showed something similar where if he took uh, two organisms, in this case, bacteria stayed out of Omicron, bacteria cacae, put them on um, a rich diet, then you see that they can both colonize to different levels. But if you switch them to um, a saccharide inulin that cacae prefers and data doesn't, then you can see that only during uh, this restricted diet, you see this competition. And in some cases, you do not see competition. And so we became interested in this, this concept of long-term colonization. Uh, on a rich diet. And so the way we uh, approach this is gavaging animals with, um, with laboratory-grown bacteria is artificial, so we looked at uh, horizontal transmission. So we took two different groups of animals, uh, one colonized with wild type, one colonized with a mutant, and then co-housed these animals and looked for transfer of the wild type to the mutant colonized and vice versa. So here you're looking at the wild type animals. Um, that were uh, after co-housing for 14 days. So these animals were initially colonized with the wild type bacteria. You can see that here. But if we then uh, co-house them with the mutant bacteria, the mutant never transfers into a mouse that has already been established with the wild type. But when we do the converse and the uh, initial organism is the mutant, then the wild type can very efficiently transfer over. And in fact, every animal can now colonize. So even uh, during horizontal transmission, there's a defect for the CCF genes.
um, where are these genes expressed? So they're, they're very ex expressed in very, very low abundance in culture and various degrees throughout the intestine, but most highly uh, associated with the ascending colon. And so Melanie uh, became interested in what's going on in the ascending colon and started looking down at the colonization of these organisms in intestinal crypts. And so here you're looking at um, images of a confocal micrograph um, uh, of a whole mount microscopy, uh, looking at one particular crypt, but of course we've looked at many of them. And when you look in the center of the script, only wild type Bacteroides fragilis can colonize this mouse. So once again, these are germ-free animals, and we're looking in the intestinal crypts only in the ascending colon. Whereas if we uh, mono-associate a mouse with um, uh, the mutant, even though the luminal contents are identical, none of these bacteria wind up in the intestinal crypt. Here's the control for germ-free animals. And another way of looking at this is through two-photon microscopy. So this is um, a crypt, so the dark area is the void space of a crypt. And as you can see, only the wild-type bacteria can penetrate into this crypt. The mutant is at the epithelial surface, but never really gets into the crypt. And we can quantify hundreds of different crypts. And you can see here we're looking at the distance from the epithelium, and the wild-type penetrates uh, further into these crypts than the mutant. And so uh, what we conclude is that these, this particular clade of the um, of polysaccharide utilization loci, the CCF, re are required for colonization of these crypts. And so finally, what does this mean in terms of resilience or stability? And so here what we did is we took SPF mice and uh, we used a protocol by Thad Stappenbeck to be able to colonize these SPF mice with, um, with, with uh, Bacteroides. So we can initially treat them with an antibiotic to displace the indigenous microbes and then um, colonize them with either Bacteroides fragilis wild type or the CCF mutant. And here you can see very, very uh, similar levels of colonization. But if we then challenge that, those animals with ciprofloxacin, so very similar to the experiment that David did in humans, that you can see that the wild type bacteria is maintained, but the mutant bacteria is, is greatly reduced and thus much more sensitive to ciprofloxacin. And in fact, what we've done now with this experiment is we've taken wild type associated mice and given them a very high concentration of cipro for a very long period of time. We can clear the luminal bacteria, but if we look in the crypts of these mice on antibiotic treatment, the bacteria are still in these reservoirs. They're still in the crypts. And so uh, it looks like those bacteria in the crypts are resistant to the antibiotic. And another perturbation that we use was Citrobacter rodentum infection. The paradigm for colonization is the same. And then we introduce um, the C. rodentum infection. And as you can see um, in the dark blue bars, the wild type bacteria are maintained, but here we get even a more dramatic phenotype for the mutant. It's completely cleared from, from the ecosystem and you can never recover this organism again. Once again, the CCF genes are required for resilience and in the black bars are the, are the Citrobacter. So all in all, um, it looks like uh, these bacteria have evolved mechanisms to stably associate with the host and to populate specific regions of the gut in a way that we think is, is using polysaccharides and glycans based on homology, and we were really interested in understanding what those glycans are. And so uh, to conclude, I'm gonna actually take a, a quote from Rolf Freder, uh, uh proposed 30 years ago. And what Rolf did was he took um, uh, mice, and he looked at transit times of various organisms and then used mathematical modeling to come up with this concept that, and I'm just going to read this, is that most indigenous organisms in the gut are controlled by substrate competition. That they're competing with each other for, for nutrients, particularly nutrients, and that some species are better than others in uh, acquiring these nutrients and that these, the population level of those species is controlled by the concentrations of a few limiting substrates. And I think this is very important because this nicely explains our data for how uh, organisms will compete against each other but not other organisms because they're using very, very few uh, of these substrates but different substrates across different species. And what we've done, uh, I think, is extended that to this notion that there are populations of cells, perhaps my, you know, microbial stem cells, if you will, that uh, allow persistent occupation of these satrapal niches. And once there's a perturbation to the system, some sort of environmental stress that, that um, uh, disrupts the luminal bacteria, that these reservoirs still exist, and these reservoirs can be used to repopulate the gut, and if I were a bacteria that only lived in the mammalian colon, I would evolve this mechanism to ensure my long-term colonization, and perhaps this is one of those mechanisms, um, at least in bacteroides. And so um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the people who did the work. So um, the PSA work was done by a very talented postdoc, June Round, who now has her own lab at the University of Utah. As I mentioned, Melanie um, worked on the crypt occupancy.
uh, project with help from a new graduate student, Greg, in the lab, as well as Silva. These are the other members of the lab, our collaborators, and I'd really like to acknowledge uh, Klaus Ley, who takes these wonderful images for us in the colon. This is an actual crypt of a mouse colon. Um, and so uh, we drew in the bacteria, but you can see the, the beautiful architecture here. And he was instrumental in us um, uh, understanding the mechanisms by which uh, the CCF genes are working. And of course, the funding agencies, we've had uh, two grants from NIDDK and then one from GM, as well as uh, funding from the CCFA. And so then in terms of questions and gaps, and a lot of this really dovetails off some of the concepts that we've already heard, is um, maybe on a more teleological level, how do we assemble the microbiota? Do we choose our own microbiota or do they select us? Have they, over the uh, uh, millennia, evolved mechanisms to uh, associate with hosts in a very specific way? And I think that if we can understand those molecular mechanisms, then we can really understand uh, microbial secession. And so, once again, we've heard a lot about that. And maybe we've heard a little bit less about biogeography. And so there are different uh, organisms in different regions of the gut. I think we know this quite well. Harder to sample in humans, but I think the, the mechanisms are, are um, coming online soon, easier in mice, but yet still not that many people are doing this. I'd like to remind you that there's a different biogeography if you go longitudinally versus cross-sectionally. I think that's also important uh, as well. And these molecular mechanisms uh, may really help us understand that. And um, the other uh, important question is, can we somehow exploit this uh, colonization root phenotype to help us uh, resist pathogens. So there's a, a lot of history going back many years from Dwayne Savage and, and uh, Terrell Conway talking about colonization resistance in bacteria. And if we can somehow engineer organisms to compete against uh, pathogens, if pathogens use similar systems, then we could um, perhaps perhaps target uh, pathogenic infections by making better probiotics or targeted designer probiotics. And ultimately, is there a, a way to exploit the system to correct dysbiosis? And so once again, we've heard about this concept over and over. And if we can understand what those sugars are or understand what expresses those sugars, then perhaps we can pharmacologically induce the, um, the uh, substrates for these, um, for these organisms and then once again correct dysbiosis by promoting colonization. And then the needs, um, I think uh, some of these were already mentioned yesterday, but I think that they're worth repeating because they're, they're quite important, is this incredible heterogeneity in organisms or in, in mice uh, and their microbiota from different vendors. And so we know this from the work of Dan Lippmann and others that the microbiota is very, very different in different, um, uh, uh, from different commercial vendors. And this really affects our experiments. And so if you look across the literature for, for let's say, Treg development in the gut, you see very different numbers on, from different facilities and different countries. And I think that having some sort of standardization uh, would really help with that. And uh, perhaps we can even uh, think about humanizing uh, these mice and having a cohort of mice that could be disseminated to, to the community and so that we could all be uh, doing experiments on the same plane. And then uh, something that, that I think is quite important but often overlooked is whether or not our germ-free mice are the same. And so we clearly know that there's genetic drift in uh, different um, colonies and even our germ-free animals, whether how rigorously we've tested them, may have genotypic differences. In fact, we know this because if you look at microsatellite mapping of a black six mouse from different um, vendors, the microsatellites are different. So there has been genetic drift. All black six mice are not the same. So a central repository, I think, would be terrific. And um, finally, um, uh, just to uh, reiterate, some of the concepts that Maria talked about, but, but perhaps more in mice because they're feasible, is uh, longitudinal multi-generation studies. So looking at not just the lifespan of one organism, but the ability of that organism to transfer its microbiota to, um, to its offspring on um, several generations, but including uh, perturbations that are affecting our, our lifestyle, such as diet and antibiotics. We've become quite interested in environmental antimicrobials. I think many of us already know that there are very potent antimicrobials in all parts of, of our lifestyle, and we're ingesting these, these um, antimicrobials, and perhaps they can have an effect on our microbiome and our ability to pass that microbiome onto our uh, offspring. And I think this might be a nice way, at least in mice, to test cause and effect relationships and get away from associations and understand the cause and effect relationships that could be mediating the uh, um, increase in allergic and autoimmune as well as behavioral disorders. So uh, those are my thoughts, and I'd stop there, and I think we have a minute for questions. <laughs>
Sarkis, thanks for a wonderful talk as always. Is there a quick question from anybody? Right in the center. Uh, great talk, Sarkis. Can you comment on the strain specificity? So this question of what keeps the same bug from coming in where it already may or may not be, and the question of dynamics of different species coming in, I think you've hit on something that could be an important part of that. So do different strains of fragilis show mm -hmm. the phenotype, or, or what's the, how far do you have to go before you, you see this? Yeah, we, we've never looked at strains, but those can be important as well. And so we've looked at, we work with uh, Bacteria fragilis 9343, and we've looked at the genome of 638R, as well as the other sequence Bacteria fragilis. There are some differences in the CCF loci. They may mediate colonization differences, but we've actually never done the experiment. Sarkis, what do you think is going on in the CRIPS in the differential colonization? Is that something like substrate, substrate availability? Yeah, so I think that the, the homology to these SUS systems and to the polysaccharide utilization loci um, um, suggests that there's a limited glycan, perhaps a host glycan, most likely a host glycan, that is specific to the crypts. And in fact, when we look at a field of, of um, a, a monocolonized animal, not every crypt is occupied by bacteria. And so even though there's only one organism, it doesn't get into every crypt. So I think that uh, perhaps what this, what this argues is that not all the crypts are the same. And so whether the bacteria induces its substrate or was there the entire time, the bacteria figured out which crypts to occupy and which ones um, not to. So there might be some developmental biology that we can understand through these organisms. And I think ultimately, that once again, the way this is going to work is that that limited um, substrate, most likely a glycan, is utilized by a specific CCF and if it's um, utilized by an initial strain, then the challenge strain can't compete, but two different species are not using that same glycan, so therefore they're not competing against each other. One more quick question. So you've shown really elegantly that this works for one strain or one species. How many different species substrate combinations do you think there are? I mean, there are thousands of different Spe gut species, uh, bacterial species in the gut. I mean, is it possible that each one of these has its own separate um, substrate that it's working on? Yeah, so we don't know, but in terms, of, so there may be many other mechanisms for colonization that don't involve polysaccharide utilization loci. And so the answer is we don't know, but when we look at the CCF genes and what types of organisms we can find them in, they're only in intestinal bacteroides. They're not in bacteroides or even bacteroidetes that are not part of the mammalian gut. So if you look in other ecosystems, they don't have these CCF genes. And so I think that this is one colonization mechanism. I think it's a colonization mechanism that's conserved in bacteroides, but things like Clostridium and, and, and Proteobacteria probably use different mechanisms, maybe entirely different mechanisms. <coughs> and once again, those are not competing against each other in a way that we can measure. Sorry, Thank thanks you. again for a wonderful talk. Yeah. I'm pleased. Uh, Gene Chang from the University of Chicago. The title of his talk is Ground Zero, the Impact of the Gut Microbiome on Host Epithelial Functions and Responses.